Hello, my name is Eric Stephen, and I am one of the pastors at the Village Church. The following podcast is a ministry of the Village Church. We hope that it inspires you, that it draws you closer to Jesus, and it opens your eyes to the possibilities of living in the kingdom. Enjoy, and God bless. Father in heaven, thank you for this beautiful community morning and evening. Thank you for the way you have shaped all of us um, and drawn us to you and given us just uh, one another to, to explore you and to figure you out. And Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for our sins and raising from the dead and, and giving us the freedom to just be messy in your throne room because, Jesus, you died for us and your, sin, your, your blood covers us. Holy Spirit, as we wrestle with hard things, as we wrestle with your words, I ask that you would give us courage to believe what's true and to push aside what's false. Um, And I ask all of that in your name, Jesus. Amen. We are in the Books of the Bible series. And the kind of crazy thing about the Books of the Bible series is we got three more books of the Old Testament, and then you will be able, from Genesis to Malachi, you'll be able to listen to everything a summary of every single book of the Old Testament. That's awesome. And then we're just going to dive into the New Testament. Um, Today, we're covering Haggai. Now, I used to say Haggai, and I probably will say Haggai while I'm preaching. But I thought, okay, a lot of people have preached on Haggai. I'm going to go onto YouTube where everybody puts their sermons and look at the beginning of like eight or nine sermons and see what it is, that how these people say this word. Well, as Americans, we say this word in the South as Haggai, this name. That's how we say it, Haggai, I don't know, with a Southern accent. And if you go more to the West or to the North, you say Haggai. But the proper way to say it is Haggai. Or if you want to say it as the British says it, Sue, can you give that to me? Haggai. Yeah, something like that. That's how it works. So, who is Haggai. Well, Haggai is a minor prophet. And what is a minor prophet? Well, you've heard me say this over and over again, but it's probably important for you to remember a few of these. Number one, it's not because he's, they're not that important, but they're shorter in content, meaning they spent less time in ministry. They all are on one scroll. So Isaiah is on its own scroll. All the minor uh, prophets are on one scroll. It tends to be what we would call liturgy. So they're prophecies, they're prophets who the Jewish community would read over and over again because they address certain issues. So if you remember, I told you about Jonah. Everybody would would be read once a year and everyone stands for Jonah. And then after it's been read, everyone says, we are Jonah. Or when we talked about Habakkuk, Habakkuk was all about lament. Why is it that this good God allows all this hard stuff to happen? Well, the whole prophecy kind of works that out and helps us wrestle with it. So it's part of a liturgy. It's part of what happens in the service, the different things you're going to learn and wrestle with and be asked to deal with. So Haggai is no different. But Haggai is also what we would call a post-exilic prophet, meaning he prophesied after everyone returned from exile. So just to remind you about how it all works, Last week, Larry preached a really wonderful sermon. And then Harry's, Harry, sorry, Larry, I'm sure you're screen. I called you Harry. So when you see Larry, now we're all going to call him Harry. Okay. But Larry talked about just giving a summary of everything. He said, okay, so Israel had David. He was good. He's a decent king. And then we had Solomon. But after Solomon, everything kind of went haywire. And Israel split into two nations, right? The northern nation and the southern nation kingdom. And the southern kingdom had Jerusalem and the temple, right? That's the main part of worship was in the southern kingdom. Well, the northern kingdom, if you read the history, if you go read the Bible, you'll find out they aren't that great. And the Assyrians come along and just kind of take them over and they scatter them all over the place because the Assyrians were not interested in holding on to your ethnic identity. The Babylonians a little different. And so eventually, If you remember, as we've summarized all of these prophets of late, what do they keep saying? The Babylonians are coming. The Babylonians are coming. Well, the Babylonians came and took all of the southern kingdom into exile. 
into Babylon. That happened at 587. But what happened to the Babylonians for you, or Babylonians for you, history buffs? And who took them over? The Persians. Yes, the Persians came along. And the Persians, you know, it's like getting, they're the better of two bads. And so the Persians actually said, hey, you know what, Israel? You can go back. And so 50,000 people led by Zerubbabel, led by Haggai, led by Joshua the priest, head back to rebuild Jerusalem, to rebuild the temple. The thing you need to understand about these 50,000 people is they are serious people. They are people who fear God. They are people who are serious about reestablishing things. Because actually it was probably a little bit better in Persia than heading all the way back down to the southern kingdom in order for you to then fight all the people who were there and deal with all the intrigue. And you can find all about that in Ezra if you want to read it. But these are people who are serious about reestablishing God's temple, reestablishing his city. They want to follow God. They want to see the one true God being worshipped. So they head on down. They're pretty serious. The beauty of it all is we know exactly when it happened. We know when they started at least to rebuild the temple temple, and that was in 520 B.C. So, whoops, I got control. I have control. All right, so before I get into talking about Haggai the prophet and all that good kind of thing, I want to tell you a story because I want to illustrate something for you. Now, I will preface this story with telling you it doesn't really illustrate the point as well as I'd like it to, but I want to tell a story anyway, so I'm going to. So I went on vacation And on vacation, we headed into Texas, by the way, with a car with no duct tape and returned with a car full of duct tape. But we headed into Texas, and on our way back from our cool little conference, we're weaving through the the highways of Texas at 75 miles an hour, and I'm looking around thinking, why are there all these dead vultures everywhere? And then we come up over a hill, and lo and behold, in front of us, at 75 miles an hour, is three vultures eating another vulture in the middle of the road. They all look up because they hear the car, and two of them take off. The third one, in slow motion, and I still imagine in slow motion, looked at us, paused for a moment, took a bite of his buddy who was dead, and then flew off to the left. So I'm, there's a guy right on my tail. I really can't hit my brakes. He's a kind of a Texas tailor, and so I just go right. So I miss the bird who goes whoosh, you know, this, you know, vulture, but he smashes into my side mirror right, and shatters it. So for another thousand miles, I have to keep asking my wife, are you sure it's clear over there? Can I really get in that lane? Um, and I had to duct tape it all together. Now, I tell you this story because then a few days ago, out of nowhere with no title, Bob Ewing sent me a poem. This is the poem. Two Disciples. Three vultures of the apocalypse, two departed, content to taste death another day. The third remains, demanding his fill now. The disciples cannot look back. Now, if you were to have just read this, but you didn't know my story, it would not mean as much to you as it means to me, right? In fact, it could be a really cool poem to you, and you might find some really good things in it, but you wouldn't know what it truly meant. Or, at least, it wasn't for you. This is true about the Bible. The Bible was not written to you. I know that's a shocker, but you're not trying to rebuild the temple. Haggai is not writing. He didn't wake up and say, oh man, Corey and Colleen right here, like I am going to write a whole prophecy for them. No, he's writing to Israel in the moment. He is writing to them. But the Bible is written for you. The Bible is authoritative and it is inspired, but it is also written to a particular people. Now here's why I want to say that before we get into all of what we're going to say. Is that it is very easy when you read the Old Testament to do something called moralizing and to take it out of its context. So you might have noticed that a sign-up sheet was going around, and if you don't know, I'll just give you a quick clue. Haggai is about rebuilding the temple, okay? and it's all about that process of that. So you saw a sign-up sheet going around about our workday for this building. 
And I want to address a few things that Haggai addresses in your life, and that is that some of you are remodeling your house and spending money on your homes, and you are not spending money on this temple here. Have you driven in and seen the parking lot that's unpaved? You need to decide what God wants. You need to change your priorities. This is the way Haggai could be used. It can be simply taken out of context, and I will use it to make you do what I want you to do. Right? That's not the point of Haggai, and I want to help you see as a follower of Jesus, who is a Christian, who is on the other side of the cross and the resurrection and the ascension and the sending out of the Spirit. So here you are in the, in the 21st century, 2022, how do I read Haggai and what is it actually inviting me into? Okay? So here's the beauty of Haggai. We know exactly when it was written because the post-exilic prophets really like the Persian calendar, the Babylonian Persian calendar, and it corresponds to the Julian calendar. And so we know exactly when it happens. It starts in August 29th, 520. The next prophecy is September 21, then October 17th, and then the very last two are on the 18th of December. Here's what the first reason that Haggai is important to us. August 29th is hotter than Tucson. So the Israelites are getting their message from God, and they feel just like you felt when you came into this building, when you had to walk from your car to the door, right, in 105 degrees. Exactly. This is how they feel. God's word and his prophetic word feels a little bit difficult to deal with because everything in your body is a little sticky, right? So we'll start there. But it's the beauty of this because, is that you know exactly when this happened. We know exactly when Haggai started talking, when he offered these prophetic words. Now, you got to do something really cool, and you got to hear the entire book of Haggai read. It is the second shortest book in the Bible. So I'm going to give you an overview, and I'm going to work through it a little bit, and then we're going to talk about some important things. So we'll start. So the book of Haggai opens with this idea. God speaks, and by the way, the Lord Almighty is mentioned 14 times in Haggai, and it's, the Lord Almighty is only mentioned 60 times in the whole Testament. So the Lord Almighty, he's trying to, you know, Haggai's trying to make a point. What's being said is serious, right? Serious face, for those of you who understand that. Those of you who don't, work on it. All right. <laughs> The first idea is your house versus my house. And God says, hey, guys, why are you living in paneled homes? Meaning you've spent some time remodeling and fixing your home, and you haven't done anything to mine. All there is is basically a foundation for the temple. And what had happened is for 16 years, they had quit working on the temple because the Sumerians had started doing some things with the Persians and complaining, and there was a lot of temple intrigue that was happening, and some legal things had to be taken care of. So they just, instead of dealing with the resistance and trying to go build the temple anyway and having to be uncomfortable, they just decided, we'll just not do it for 16 years. And so what God says is, well, all these things that you've gone and tried to do, they've come out empty, right? You, your, your, your money purse has holes. Everything that you've been trying to do isn't fulfilling you. And the reason that is is that I'm doing that to you, and it's just like your parents, Right? These are the things your parents were doing. The people who were carried into exile, they, if you remember all the other prophets, what the prophets say, why is it that you're so focused on your thing and your gain and your taking advantage of people? Why, is, why are you pursuing this when you should be pursuing me? And so what Haggai says, or what God says through Haggai is, hey, don't, he kind of alludes, he says, don't be like your parents. You know what? This is wrong. You need to work on my home. You need to take the temple seriously. Now what's remarkable about all of this is that they respond in a good way. They respond in a good way. Listen to what it, the second half of verse 12 of chapter 1 says. Obey the voice, the people obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the message of the prophet Haggai because the Lord their God had sent him and the people feared the Lord. Remember what I said in the beginning. These 50,000 people and 
Zerubbabel and Joshua and Haggai, they, they were not, you know, just, oh, let's go down. They were serious about God. They feared God. They wanted to do this. But what had happened is that when opposition came along, they kind of backed away and did the easy thing, right? And so when they're confronted with that, they're like, oh, no, no, no. We want to do what God says. And so they repent and they obey. And they turn around. And it actually says that the Spirit of God, as soon as they acknowledge that this is what they need to do, the Spirit of God stirred in their hearts, right? Moved them in the direction they should go. And in three weeks, so 16 years of not building the temple, three weeks, they put their mind and body and soul into building the temple. And guess what? They got really discouraged which I suspect you do too, when you're faced with something where you're like, okay, this is what God's calling me to do. This is the right thing to do. And then it gets hard, or it's not what you thought it was going to be. So there were some people who had come back from exile that had seen Solomon's temple. Solomon's temple was impressive. The temple they were building was little and tiny. It's like the village building compared to a cathedral in Europe. Like they're building the village building. Solomon's temple is a cathedral, right? St. Peter's. That's the difference. And so they're like, this is discouraging. We don't have any, this isn't important. It's not like it used to be. Maybe it doesn't, it's meaningless. And so what God says, God comes to them and he encourages them. He says a couple things. Number one, he says, I am with you. Number two, be strong. This is the thing that God says to us all the time. Every time you face trial, the words of God are, I am with you, be strong. And then he says, what you're doing is not insignificant. This temple you're building is actually going to be more important than Solomon's temple. And guess what? Since the temple was built, we have been talking about some second temple, Judaism. Because who interacted with the temple? Jesus. Jesus drew everything to the temple. Right? And then he says, this temple is going to be linked to peace. So he says, in the moments of your discouragement, what you're doing is important. It's going to bring peace. You're going to have to trust me. Be strong. I'm with you. That's a good thing. We all have those. If we follow God and God confronts us with the things that we need to be confronted with, then we repent and God's really encouraging and moving us through the hard points. But then we're asked to actually live a life of discipline. And so Haggai, the the third moment or the third section of Haggai in chapter two is a discussion between the priests and Haggai. And it's really about the curses in Deuteronomy 28, but those don't really matter. What he's talking about is how things happen get unclean and clean. And it's a conversation about what the people need to avoid and what they need to keep in their mind, right? How you live affects everything. So if you are still focused on the things that you were focused on, right? Your home, your paneling, your remodeling, and God's house, then you're bringing your selfishness into the building of God's house and you're contaminating the house. You have to be on one path or another, right? And if you decide to take the path that is unclean, you're going to contaminate the temple. And so what he says, if you are going to live a life that is focused on the rebuilding and the practices of the temple, I will bless you, right? I will bless you from this day forth. And then at the very end, he talks to king, or he talks to the leader, Zerubbabel. Now, It's very important for you to understand this. David is the king whom whom the Messiah is going to come in his line, right? This promise of the Savior is going to come in the line of David. Guess what? By the time they get back from post-exile, there is no line of David anymore. But Zerubbabel happens to be a great, great, great grandson of David. And so what God says to Zerubbabel, even though you think you're not doing much of anything, even though you think that what you're doing isn't that big of a deal, you're going to be a signet ring. You're going to be something that people talk about, look at, 
into the end of time. Well, guess where he shows up? Matthew 1, 2, in the genealogy of Jesus. Luke 3, 27, in the genealogy of Jesus. Guess whose name gets repeated over and over again? Not Haggai, but Zerubbabel. Every time we open the Gospels, we're reading about Zerubbabel, the great-great-grandson of David, and the forerunner of Jesus, right? He's in the line of Jesus. And this happens. This is the way kind of God usually enters our life as we begin to pursue him and focus on him. He says, you know what? Let me give you a little vision of who you're going to be. Let me give you a little bit of a taste. But Zerubbabel didn't have any idea, I suspect, the significance of what God was giving him. And neither do we. All right. So that's a summary of Haggai. But the thing we need to talk about is the temple. Why is the temple infinite important? Why are we building temples? In fact, before the temple, why did Israel wander around with a tent called the tabernacle? Why is this important? Why was it important even in the Gospels? Well, because the temple is the visible symbol of God dwelling in their midst. But before we get to that, remember that in Haggai, he says twice, I am with you. But there was no full, completed temple. He does not need a temple to be with them. But the temple says to the outside world and to the people, this is where God dwells. And it is where heaven and earth come together. And in fact, it, is, it was the footstool. The idea was that God's foot rested in that point. Right? It is the visible symbol of God's dwelling in their midst. It is the center of worship. So why is this important then to us as Christians? Well, in John, in the Gospel of John, which is in the New Testament, 1-4, and speaking of Jesus, it says the Word, which is Jesus, became flesh, right? became us, fully God, fully man, and made his dwelling among us. We have seen the glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus, fully God, fully man, became the mobile temple. He became the presence, the visible presence of God amongst us. Okay, it's a little mind-blowing. So, Still, as followers of Jesus, what are we to do? Why, what, how do we read Haggai? What is Haggai inviting us into? Well, Jesus lived a life that you could not live. Died a death you can't die. He died for your sins. He rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven. He sent his spirit to flood the earth to anyone who will embrace him and surrender to him. And Paul explains what happens to us. Now, I apologize you can't read this. It's another eye test, but I suppose you can read Holy Temple in the Lord and Rises, and those are the important words. I will read the whole thing to you. Currently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers. This is speaking about Jews and Greeks. We're no longer strangers to each other. The differences no longer divide us. But fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built, you start seeing these building themes, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises, right? The temple is becoming a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you two are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Why is the temple important to us as a church? Why is it important that we read Haggai and understand who we are? Because it will transform the way we understand ourselves. We are the temple of God. We are the visible representation, the visible presence of God. Here, as a people, gathered, the village. I went to a memorial service last yesterday, and the guy who did the memorial service was the pastor across the street. This morning, while I was preaching, he was preaching. The visible temple of God was across the street, and the visible temple of God was here. And the visible temple of God is all over the place when we gather, right? God's spirit spirit dwelling in us. So when we begin to think about the construction of the temple, he's talking about then us. There's this foreshadowing of us. We are the temple, collectively, together. But... It gets a little better, because there I am. Ancient drawing of me by my daughter. 
1 Corinthians 6, 19, Paul says, Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. Now, two things to look at. Number one, you as an individual are a temple of God. Wherever you go, the Spirit of God goes. Now, I know you've heard me say this, but it's really, really important to know. Collectively, temple of God. Individually, temple of God. Anytime we're reading the Old Testament talking about the temple of God, we want to think about the church. We want to think about us. When you go to work, you are the temple. All people gathered around you who know and don't know Jesus are around the temple. And if there are other followers of Jesus, then there's a bigger temple. Like The Spirit is there wherever you go. You bring the Spirit. So when you read Haggai, we need to apply it to our, the church and to ourselves. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But the second thing is, is that very last phrase is the one that's hard to digest, and you should take a moment to think about it. You are not your own. If you are a follower of Jesus, and you have declared him to be Lord in your life and submitted your life to him, then you aren't your own. You don't get to dictate anymore. Right? You don't get to say what you're going to do. Jesus says what you're going to do. The Spirit of God shapes, molds you, and pushes you in a direction. You're not your own. You're the temple, and God calls you to different places to represent him and bring his spirit and his wisdom to bear on those spaces. So, with all that said, we have to go back to Haggai and learn the ancient Haggian way. That Haggai gives us a discipline practice, and it's a practice that you and I need to work on day after day. I think it's something that you should come to on a monthly basis. And I realized this in reading this book because I just don't usually read it when I read through the Bible and it takes five minutes to read and I move on, right? I've never spent a lot of time studying it until now. But there's some things in this text that I think we need to take a look at. Number one, every time a vision comes to Haggai and he speaks to the people, this phrase, give careful thought to your ways, shows up. Or give careful thought to your life, communally and individually, right? So what does this mean, this give careful thought? Well, the whole idea is to organize and lay things out in front of you and analyze them. So what is the thing that, that Haggai or God was asking through Haggai for people to lay out in front of them and organize? Well, there's a number of things, but the first one was their priorities. And I think that's a hard one. Because we're invited to really look at what our priorities are. That means when you lay them out, and the modern version of this might be pulling out your journal and your notebook or your pen or whatever it is, your notebook and your pen, and start analyzing your priorities. But this means that in your marriage or in your relationships with people, you're saying, am I living out my life in ways that are profitable for me and that's my goal and that's my motive is for things to be profitable to me or am I going about things in my marriage, in my parenting, in my work, in the way I relate to people, in my um, compulsions, whatever it is, am, am I submitting those to God or am I submitting them to the things that I want to have, the experiences I want to have? Right? The reason that you would be looking at that is because it's important for all of us to be healthy as the temple of God, to not have a contamination in the temple of God, in a sense, not to bring our selfishness into the community because that's destructive. Now, you can't do the Hegean way unless you fear God because it won't work. Right? You will not find a heart of repentance or obedience if you do not fear God. Right? You have to start where they start, which is with a fear of God a reverence for God, an understanding that what God says is holy, then it's easier for you to lay out and say, okay, these are my priorities, and well, I need to adjust these. And if you're willing to do that, some kind of repentance and some kind of obedience will happen in your life. You will see areas you're like, yeah, I need to repent. I need to turn around from that. I need to change the way I'm thinking about that. And I need to obey what God is saying in my life. I need to move those priorities to the side. 
But I will say that you will get discouraged because usually the path out of your addictions, the path out of your selfishness, the path out of your priorities isn't easy. And you will be like Zerubbabel and you will find, maybe it's that you just think, man, this work is hard and it doesn't really seem like it's doing anything. Or it's the village next to St. Peter Cathedral, right? Like they're just, it looks different building-wise, just a little bit, right? And you're like, ah, there's no meaning to this. But I guarantee you, if you're willing to look at your life and take careful stock of it and step into the repentance and obedience you're invited into, you will hear the same things that Haggai offered the people, which is, I am with you and be strong. I am with you and be strong. Now, God's presence, it will show up. Number four, though, and I think this is important, and I had a music just to work that out. It's very, very important. Like I said previously, is when you step into obedience and repentance, you have to practice, you have to continue to practice this. And so this is why Haggai has this conversation with the priest about what makes you unclean and what doesn't and how you don't want to contaminate the work of God because he wants us to have the discipline of examining our life. This should be something we do on a regular basis. Now, I did a, a podcast recently on Psalm 1, and Psalm 1 is a good example of how to do this. And so I just want to read the first part of Psalm 1 for you to just think about how you might take a look at what's happening in your life, and what path you're on. Blessed is the one who does not walk in the step of the, step of the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the Lord, in the law of the Lord, and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. Not so the wicked." He says they're blown like chaff and that the wicked cannot stand in the assembly of the righteous. And there's this contrast between the wicked and the righteous. They are two paths and they diverge from each other. But the more that you're willing to put yourself in the discipline of taking careful thought of your ways and what path are you on and what priorities do you have, you will find a blessing. Because the blessing is you grow closer to God. And the closer to God you are, the more you're known, seen, and called, cared for, shaped, and formed. The further away you move from God, the less the shaping happens. Right? And last, God is also in the continued process of comforting. I want you to think about it this way. N.T. Wright talks about how we're all, as followers of Jesus, stonemasons. And we are building, we are actually making stones in, the, in our Christian walk uh, for the kingdom of God. We're building the kingdom of God. We're the temple, and we're building the kingdom of God. We have no idea what the temple looks like. We have no idea what the kingdom of God looks like. We don't, we don't know what the final picture is. We're just cutting our brick. And a lot of times we're like, oh, man, this obedience, this repentance, this analysis, this, this you know, doing the things that are hard but good for me, I don't really see the benefit, really. It's not, it, seems, it seems a little less. God will come in and speak to you in those moments. I really do believe that like God speaking to Zerubbabel and saying, hey, you have a place, and I'm going to give you a little taste of it, he will give you a little taste through other people telling you who you are in the kingdom, to other people speaking your identity, to you finding in Scripture the Spirit calming your heart, he'll speak to you if you point in that direction. Now, before we end, I want to talk about this phrase, be strong. Three times, God tells the Israelites, be strong. And we live in a world where discouragement is all over the place. And the thing that God says to you is, I am with you, be strong. But I'll tell you, every time any person, when I'm suffering, says, be strong, Eric, you got it. 
I'm like, yeah, that doesn't do anything for me, right? Now, if a whole bunch of people just keep saying be strong, maybe it might for a second get me going, especially if they're blowing trumpets or something. But this word be strong, we need to take it seriously because it is this complex, beautiful word in the Hebrew. And so I want to break it down for you a little bit. So first, it means what I have written up there, I have fenced you in and I am your rear guard. And what this means is I'm on your left, I'm on your right, I'm behind you, keep your eyes forward. Don't look left, don't look right, don't look behind you. Look at me, right? It's like the picture of, for those of you who know the Peter and Jesus scene, like, right, and there's the storm, and Jesus is walking in the water, and Peter's like, if it's you, let me come out, and Jesus is like, all right, it's your deal, and he jumps out, and he's looking straight at him, and then he looks, what? He looks right, and then he starts to sink, right? Be strong, God, is, Jesus, or God is saying to us, I've got your side. I've got right and left and back. Keep your eyes forward on me. But it is even more meaningful because it comes with the second definition or the second idea, which is I have a plan. But it literally means I have a divine plan for you. So it's not just right and left and back. I've got you and keep your eyes on the front. But I have a divine plan for where we're headed. Right? I have a divine plan. But the last one I like the best And it's kind of this weird phrasing that I wrote out. I will fortify your you. So this word in the Hebrew is the word that is used for the hardening of the heart of Pharaoh. So if any of you know the story of Israel and being in captivity to to the Egyptians, Pharaoh wouldn't let them go. And there's this whole conflict between Moses and its plagues. But it says in the story that God hardened his heart. But it's it's he strengthened his heart. And the idea of this word is that he took what was in Pharaoh's heart and he brought it forward and then he put scaffolding on it and he fortified it. So Pharaoh had a hardened heart towards God and God revealed it and fortified it so that it couldn't turn. When God tells you to be strong and you are a man or a woman who fears God, what he's saying is when you are got your head straight on Jesus and you know there's a divine plan and then everything seems to go wrong, God will bring the you out. He will bring the person who fears God and as you struggle and as you doubt, he will fortify your heart. He will put scaffolding all around it to make sure you stand firm. He will strengthen your heart. He will make you strong. So, as we step in, and my invitation to you as the temple of God, all of us collectively and you individually, as you begin to look at your life and analyze your priorities and wrestle with what God might be calling you to, or for most of you, as I know, in midst and throes of trial and tribulation in the moment, I want you to hear out of Haggai, if you hear nothing else, is that he speaks to those who fear him and are got their faces pointed towards him, even it, though it looks like it's not going to work out for you, He says, be strong. But that be strong is not a human, hey, it's going to be okay, be strong. He's like, I've got your right, I've got your left, I've got your front, I have a divine plan, and I will fortify your heart. Okay? It's important. Now, as we, as I've been talking about Haggai and the ancient prophet, I'm wondering what the Spirit of God has stirred up in your heart. And though I just made a very dramatic proclamation about being strong, I would like to give a little humorous uh, ban. This morning, the first question was about Leviticus, and then the rest of the questions were all about Leviticus. Please don't ask me about Leviticus. All right. (laughs) Whatever the Holy Spirit has said to you on your heart, and if it's Leviticus, we'll walk with it. Um, Please respond. We got Emily right here, and then Corey right here. I like this, be strong. Um, If you do, like I think if you do want to tell someone else, be strong or you want them to, you should think about that. Yes. You should think about how you could have their back and their left and their right. Like if you want to tell your kid, be strong. Don't just like be strong, but here's how I'm going to have your back and your left and your right and all that 
rest of it. And yeah. I'm also going to help you fortify your heart as much as possible. And, <laughs> and I got a plan. That's, that's beautiful, yeah. <laughs> to imitate God, yeah. I like that a lot. So I'm 15 pages into Boundaries for Your Soul. Now you're making a plug for the book, huh? Plug for the book. Well, there's this idea of making a U-turn, Y-O-U, U-turn, which is the idea of when you're having an emotional experience, taking a step back and looking at what that experience is in its many different parts mm -hmm. so that we can better understand and manage. I'm wondering if you could talk about like when God says, I will fortify your you, like how may, how might God participate in helping us make a you turn? Hmm. I, I like that. Well, I think one of the things that struck me out of Haggai is that when people responded to the word of God by obeying and repenting and obeying, which so really recognizing their the misplaced thinking and behavior and changing that, it doesn't say then they got to work on the temple. It says that the Spirit stirred them and they went and worked on the temple. And I think part of making the <laughs> U-turn is trusting that when I am willing to step into repentance and obedience, like I'm, that's the direction, God will come and stir my heart. He will change it. He will fortify it in the direction it needs to go. So it's like trusting that God's going to in intervene and respond to our repentance. That'd be my thought. Anybody else have any other thoughts? Stephen in the back. I'm curious if you could talk more about why you chose Pharaoh specifically, because that's always been a very strange thing to me. And if if God's going to harden my heart like he hardens Pharaoh's heart, right? Like. I don't know, it just seemed like a interesting uh, comparison there. Yeah, well, it's one, it's how the word is used. And so the, the Hebrew word is used in a whole bunch of different ways. Did you pop my slide back up? I think. Um, and each one of them, these kind of get different weightiness to them. So in the way that it's used to talk about Pharaoh, it's just to illustrate what he did. And that's where the scaffolding comes in is that he scaffolded what was already there and brought it to light. And so, though that that, that idea is, is there, um, it's linked, when God says it to, the, to his people, be strong, so when he's actually saying it, it's linked to the, the top two. So, it's, it comes with the idea that you're my people, I'm, in, I'm with you, I'm inviting you to be strong, and so that means I've got your right, left, back, and a plan. And when things get really hard, I'm going to put that scaffolding on your heart. So it's just, I use the Pharaoh simply because that's, that scaffolding idea is used there. I, know, I knew there was going to be a little bit of a red herring when I used it, but I think it illustrates what happens there. Um, I think the idea with Pharaoh is that Pharaoh's heart was evil and dark. And for the purposes of God... For Israel to step out of slavery, what he did was he brought it forward and, and supported it. So like, okay, here's your dark, ugly heart. It's, I'm going to use it to free my people. Anybody else? Thoughts? Jeff, did someone raise their hand over here? And then Sue. What I liked about your timeline was... There would be a revelation to Haggai, and he would go talk to the people and say, hey, get off your butt. And then a couple of months later, hey, hey, you're doing a good job. And a couple of months later, you know, so there was like this, there was this constant feedback. It wasn't like, get off your butt and do your job. I'll see you in 20 years. Right. No, it was like <laughs> months later, he, they got a response from right. God. Right, right. So... Yeah. Yeah, it's showing the interact like God's not just abandoned them. Together. Right. I don't think there are other prophecy prophecies that were this quick of a turnaround. No, four months. No, I no, know. It's pretty impressive. Maybe Nineveh and Jonah mm -hmm. would be your okay. other your All other right. one that's uh, that's like that. But yeah, I think those are actually the two where there's this fast turnaround. Um 
Um, I just really appreciate the way that you, you taught us Haggai. Uh, I think this is a book that I maybe would have read and not thought that it had much significance for my life. But I really appreciate the historical context and then also uh, what to do with it now as well. And I feel like what you brought out of it is definitely relevant uh, to me today. These are things that I hear God speaking in my own life. So I appreciate that. Thanks. You're welcome. Is there anybody else before? I, oh, Karen. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't see your hand, Karen. So. It was, uh, hi. So I just kind of want to unpack a little more the symbolism of Zerubbabel being like God's signet ring. Yeah. So, so my understanding is that signet ring was, it was uh, like it, it, if you had the signet ring of the, of the leader, you had literally like their authority, like yes. legal authority. I, I'm like trying to wrap my brain around something in our culture that would be kind of like it, but it. Presidential <laughs> seal. I was thinking like, here's my credit. Here's I my credit it? card. I was thinking something like that, but that's, it's not just about money, but like, so in the context of the, you know, they'd been, you know, the Kings, like the Jewish people had lost their power. So it just, I don't know, it was such a profound thing hmm. for this man to get that prophetic word. Like you, yeah, you just, like, you've got this. I, I, I'm giving you my full endorsement, I guess. Yeah, no, that's I don't, true, but definitely. I'm trying to think of like how that would apply to us. Like what are the, mm. yeah. And I mean, it does, but I'm trying to wrap my brain around what that would yeah. look like. Yeah. It's kind of like the stuff Paul talks about in Romans where nothing will separate us from the love of God. Yeah. Um, anyway, I'm, yeah. I'm just kind of working that over my mind, but I think that symbol is really powerful. And I know a bunch of you want to raise your hands, but it's 23 after, so I really need to, I'm going to close. You guys can go Just talk. really quickly. Leviticus, I was reading that, and I was wondering if you could. <laughs> oh, my. All right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray. Father in heaven, uh, thank you so much for this community, for their humor, for their willingness to wrestle with stuff. Uh, I just ask that you would bless the food and the people who are fixing it, uh, the people watching our kids um, and teaching them, and just bless our time of singing and, and taking your body and blood. Uh, I ask that all in your name, Jesus. Amen.